You ever had a dream that you were being chased? But when you tried running, it felt like you were running in mud. So you start panicking and... Oh shoot, I'm almost out of intro time. Okay, um, can you beat Persona 5 Royal with only the Jack Bros? This run, much like a liberal arts degree, is purely for entertainment. So the only rule is that I can only use Jack Bros Personas during this run. We're talking King Frost, Black Frost, Pyro Jack, Jack Frost, Cactus Jack, Cracker Jack, Jack and Daxter, Jacking Off, etc. So get your hot cocoa out, put hee ho down in the comments, and let's get cracking. I've retold the intro more times than your grandpa with Alzheimer's, so we'll be skipping the beginning. You guys already know the story. I stop a touchy Discord admin, get sent to jail, beat the case, get sent to live in an attic, and enroll in Yandere Dev's school for terrible coding and young women obsession, where he takes that last part a little too seriously. I get sent to the Matrix and learn I'm Neo, I pick up Pokemon trainers male and female, and corny ass trash over here covers the basics of my edgy society changer. Learning that their gym teacher's favorite book is Lolita, the ragtag team has to change Kamoshida's heart before anything bad happens to the girls at school. Whoops, never mind, too late for that. The team still heads into Kamoshida's palace anyway, and it's here that the game begins. Getting one of the Jack Bros actually isn't too difficult, since Pyro Jack is one of the very first enemies you fight in the game. He's weak to wind, so one Garu from Morgana, and the spooky boy is mine. Pyro Jack is actually a pretty sturdy persona with strong fire skills, but he also has two weaknesses, ice and wind, which are kind of a pain this early on in the game. It's still great to have him this early though, since his flame magic helps when we recruit on by fighting Belphegor. Before finishing Kamoshida's palace, I head back to the real world to meet one of the Hex girls, who has no issue serving drugs to a student as long as he pipes her down occasionally. I also head to an airsoft gun store, just in case some demons want to pop smoke and I want to woo back and let the woo clap. Once I'm back in Kamoshida's palace, things go pretty smoothly. Most enemies can be beaten by spamming gun attacks, and those that can't usually have a weakness that I can exploit. Many bosses get beaten, puzzles get solved, and the phantom thieves reach Kamoshida's erect tower of dysfunction. They find the treasure, but before I send the calling card, I do some grinding on Beeriths to get to level 11. Jack Frost can be fused at level 11, and is significantly stronger than Pyro Jack this early in the game. Getting him before the first boss fight will save a lot of time. I get Jack Frost, he calls me a hoe, I send out the calling card, and it's time to give Kamoshida a good jacking. Kamoshida is like a tutorial boss in how easy he is. There's no gimmicks in his attacks, he's not all that strong, and since my team is level 11, they know moves that make this fight quick to end, like Ryuji's Tarukaja, Morgana's Media, and Ans Tarunda. Kamoshida only uses physical attacks, so there's no way for him to exploit a weakness. And once the crown is off of his head, the fight is over. After beating Kamoshida, I spend my free time doing regular teenager things, like hanging with friends, having a crappy job, being silently judged by my peers, and trying to fuck my doctor. Kamoshida confesses by threatening to commit seppuku in front of high school students like the reasonable adult he is, and the gang celebrates the victory of their first emotional hijacking. I decide to name the Phantom Thieves Subscribe Ho, because I'd like to hit 50,000 subs before the end of the year, and because I have no shame. Before the next palace starts, I unlock the gym by hanging out with Ryuji. This is important to mention because I will be spending a lot of time here for the rest of the run, since it's the only place that boosts health and SP at the same time. The gang also gets introduced to Mementos, Corny Ass Trash turns into Corny Ass Railway, and I meet Cliffhanger, the character. Later, I hang out with Mishima. Not because I like him, but because he boosts experience gain, and I only associate with people that I can take something from. The next day at school, Frank Fontaine becomes the new counselor and pulls a would you kindly on me to get me to go to therapy. After school, we get stopped by Leon Kennedy, who asks us to come to his master's art show. Once at the exhibit, McCree reveals that his master is none other than Madarame, a painter who never does any tasks and seems pretty sus. The gang finds out that Madarame is an imposter, so they head into his palace to find out what he's hiding. Turns out Madarame takes credit for his apprentice's works, 
and it's time to get like a Yu-Gi-Oh card and change some hearts. Madarame's palace has a pretty widespread of enemies, each with various weaknesses. But with both Pyro Jack and Jack Frost, I have a good spread of fire and ice skills, while the rest of the party covers most of the other elements. This makes getting through the palace pretty easy. Well, that and the fact that I've beaten Persona 5 Royal more times than I've beaten my- Even Shiki the Freaky had no chance against me, since I actually have Personas with strong magic damage. Afterwards, Morgana proves he's the worst cat burglar in the business, Joker saves the thieves on his solo dolo, and I decide to kill Regent, because I need that sweet, sweet XP. Everything goes smooth until we hit a roadblock in the palace, an electrical fence that looks way too jumpable to be a roadblock. Regardless, I leave the palace and on distracts Yusuke by popping that pussy so that we can unlock the door blocking our path. Madarame catches them though, turns against Yusuke, and somehow on Yusuke and Morgana end up in the palace. No seriously, that part is never explained. Either way, Yusuke finds out that Madarame only cares about money like Mr. Krabs, so he awakens his persona and joins the fight. This fight usually gives me trouble. The bird boys always cast Suku Kaja to raise evasion, and Thick Boy in the back just smacks me around until all my party members die. This time though, it's a breeze. Since Kapatingu is weak to ice, Jack Frost has no issue wiping them off the map, and with only one left to beat, I slowly whittle his health down until victory. Afterwards, Yusuke formally joins the squad, I spend some time with my therapist to figure out why I do these challenge runs, and I get insta-kill from Ryuji basically eliminating any challenge from the rest of this run. Back in Madarame's palace, it's more of the same. Bopping enemies, running around in paintings, and saying hee-ho out loud more often than I should. After running around the physical representation of my mental state and taking a closer look at the world of art, I find Madarame's treasure, with more security on it than a Catholic woman with a chastity belt. But like a Catholic woman with a chastity belt, there's always a back door. In this case, my back door was the crane system hanging conveniently above the treasure. Time for the calling card. But before that, I go to a Y and get the latest equipment, and go back to the Velvet Room to start the Twin Warden's Confidant. I actually forgot that I needed them to be at level 1 in order to do Group Guillotine. Group Guillotine is needed to get the ultimate Jack Bro, so it's actually pretty important. Before leaving the Velvet Room, I summon Izanagi Picaro and itemize him giving me growth too, and give it to Pyro Jack. This will allow him to keep his level up while I use Jack Frost. With no other prep necessary, I send the calling card, capture the treasure, and go into the fight with Madarame. Madarame has notoriously gone from the easiest boss for me in Persona 5 to the hardest boss for me in Persona 5 Royal. Both stages can be tricky if you let the fight go on for too long. Thankfully, I've done this too many times to fail. I focus on multi-hitting attacks with the paintings, and then I focus on individual magic attacks, baton passes, and abusing weaknesses when Madarame splits into his elemental versions. With Ryuji and Yusuke also dealing massive physical damage on top of that, the fight is a quick one. In between arcs, I pick up a second job due to wage inequality, I discover that my teacher is into freaky roleplay, and I start spending time with On, because her level 4 ability sometimes stops enemies from attacking. There's also this random scene with this girl I've never seen before. But it's not really important to the story, and we never see her again, so I'll just skip it. I also managed to start Kawakami's Confidant, and head into Mementos to do some requests for Mishima's storyline, as well as get a few decent skill cards. Madarame gets caught in 4k and confesses to his crimes, and Ryuji and I head to Kichi Joji, where apparently my crazy ex somehow got an invitation. Later on, Akechi says that thing that everyone thinks is really, really funny, and the gang goes to a live filming of their favorite TV show, Somebody Here is a Murderer. Akechi saw me in the crowd and thought I was pretty cute, so he asks for my number. And I agree, because I don't want to know what would happen if I said no. The next day at school, my ex-girlfriend calls me in to ask why I've been hanging out with On so much. I try to tell her it's because we're the Phantom Thieves, but she doesn't believe me so I end up just taking her to the metaverse so she'll shut up about it. That was a mistake, because she ends up having a persona of her own and wants to join the group to stop the notorious criminal, Kanashiro. 
we let her join so she won't bitch about it and decide to go after Kaneshiro. Kaneshiro's palace is also the first palace where Joker's damage really starts to fall off. Pyro Jack and Jack Frost are still 4-5 to five levels weaker than Joker, which makes me do less damage. To mitigate that, I capture Orthrus, which I'll itemize into Meragion when there's an alarm, buffing my fire damage for Pyro Jack. I blow through Kaneshiro's palace until I need two keys to open this fault, which is blocking the only path forward. The keys are held by two guard captains, the first being Fook Me. This fight went extremely lucky for me. On inflicted a burn on him early, allowing Makoto to do technical damage to him with nuclear attacks. Ryuji finished him off with a headbutt, leaving Joker with nothing to do. The second captain, Suk Me, is weak to nuclear attacks, so having Makoto and the party makes the fight a wash. Add on to the fact that he only knows ice moves, which Jack Frost blocks, and it's just too easy. After opening the vault and avoiding cameras like a celebrity in a scandal, I run into the final guard captain on my way to the treasure, Kinky. Kinky also brings his promiscuous brothers Suk Me and Fook Me back for a seductive showdown, but it turns into an ass whooping. I mean, I've beaten these guys with only replica weapons before, did you really expect me to lose with ice conjuring demons? After beating the sexy squad, the gang takes the elevator down to the final area of the palace, the vault. The vault is really annoying, but this time I just avoided collecting all the pages and went straight to entering the codes, because I've memorized them to get out of this hellhole as soon as possible. I reach the center of the vault, find the treasure, and it's time to stick my he up Kaneshiro's hoe. But before I do that, if you guys are enjoying the video, please consider leaving a like. YouTube's algorithm has been stomping me lately, and every little thing helps. And if you really enjoy the content, consider subscribing as well. Also, follow me on all of my other social medias because I'm pretty cool there too. Thanks. The fight against Kaneshiro is probably one of my least favorite. Kaneshiro controls the pace of the fight, and he's tanky, making this fight take forever. The first phase I get through surprisingly quickly. Jack Frost and Pyro Jack make Joker weaker than everyone else, so I used him to heal the party and debuff Kaneshiro, while An, Ryuji, and Yusuke wail onto the Trump allegory. It doesn't take but a few turns for the Platinum Pig to go down, and for Kaneshiro's second phase to start. Kaneshiro's second phase gimmick is putting everyone to sleep. If you don't have resistance to sleep, and someone in the party that can put enemies to sleep, you're in for a rougher time than a freshman girl at a frat house. But this isn't my first rodeo, so I brought on to put enemies to sleep and bought everyone the accessory that resists sleep before going into the fight. Kaneshiro and his guards are beefy, so it takes some time to chip away at their health. But as long as I'm not getting put to sleep, there's virtually no threat of me losing. Kaneshiro goes down, and my sanity remains intact. In my spare time, I work at the flower shop to increase my kindness, make sure my personas aren't the only thing jacked, talk to my teacher about raising my D so I can F, and hang out with Maruki for social link abilities. Kaneshiro snitches on himself, and that's another win for 16 year olds with a savior complex. Back at school, I get a text from a mysterious stranger, telling me that I need to find someone named Futaba and change their heart. I don't know who that is, but it sounds like she sucks. After looking into it, we find out that Futaba is actually Sojiro's daughter, and that she needs her heart changed before she pulls an Ernest Hemingway. The gang agrees to save her, and the palace with the best music begins. As far as palace owners go, Futaba's pretty chill. She says as long as we go get something for her, she'll let us into the treasure. So I smack Aladdin and get back her magic lamp or whatever, but instead of thanking me with treasure, she pulls a Lich King. Somehow the gang survives though, and like one hit wonder Derez Deshawn, I've got to get the treasure the hard away. After solving this glow stick puzzle, I head to the velvet room and itemize a Suk Me, giving me Mabufala, and giving Jack Frost a bit more to work with for the remaining palaces. Back in the palace, I fiddle with some Promethean boards, solve a Rubik's rectangle, and reach Futaba's treasure. Unfortunately for me, the path to the treasure is blocked. So, unlike Persona fans, I need to go talk to a girl in real life. Futaba gives us permission to go inside her, and the path to her treasure opens up. Turns out that her treasure isn't a treasure at all, 
and is instead a 50 foot sphinx resembling her mother that wants to kill her. The fight looks pretty bleak at first. There's no way to do any significant damage on Wakaba, and she wipes three of my party members immediately. Futaba somehow enters her own palace though, and joins the party to help save the day. And good thing she did. Futaba can summon ballistas that not only do big damage to Wakaba, but also ground her so the party can do big physical attacks. Wakaba can inflict despair on the party, but I've seen that trick too many times, and made sure to bring Makoto so she can cure it. With all bases covered, we whack away at Wakaba until she falls, allowing Futaba to kill her mom a second time. After escaping the palace, I look for Futaba, only to find out that she died from the strain of being in the metaverse. But she comes back to life three days later like Jesus, and helps the Phantom Thieves defeat Medjed. Realizing the power of resurrection is actually pretty baller, the gang decides to recruit Futaba, on the condition that they teach her how to act like a human being. The gang takes her to the beach, but instead of teaching her social skills, the boys reflect on their sexuality, and Makoto went on go find sugar daddies. Before the next palace, Ryuji inadvertently tells the world about the Phantom Thieves, I go see Kiryu for the latest equipment, I do some requests in Mementos, and spend some more time with the Reddit Queen. The gang goes to Hawaii to do absolutely nothing, but when we get back, we learn that the principal of the school went to go hang with the main character of Persona 3 in heaven, and everyone blames the Phantom Thieves. The pressure is too much for the gang, and Morgana leaves, giving me the only peace I'll have in this game while he's gone. But this game doesn't want me to be at peace, and the thieves immediately look for their beloved mascot, only to find him with another woman. Turns out they both need us though, because Haru's boyfriend is the Japanese Ike Turner. Morgana comes back and Haru joins the posse, and Okumura's palace starts. This palace was easily the most difficult in terms of standard fights. Pyro Jack and Jack Frost are super weak in terms of moveset, and can't abuse weaknesses, because most things here are weak to psychic. But those days in the gym have paid off for Joker, because he now has so much health and SP that he can't die either, creating fights that feel like I'm beating demons to death with a pillow. First up in Akumura's palace is beating his chain of command. The chief clerk is weak to electric, the section chief is weak to wind, and the chief director is weak to psychic. I brought Ryuji, Haru, and Morgana with me to abuse the weaknesses, and this section was done before I could say Minecraft Steve for Smash. Beating the chief director gives me access to the factory, allowing the teens to get too close to hazardous machinery and fight underpaid workers, just like a real life sweatshop. The final area is the airlock maze. After Persona 5, you'd think they'd make this area easier to get through or understand, but Atlas kept it the same, likely despite all the people that begged Persona 5 to get a Nintendo Switch port. Regardless, I stumble through space, find the exit, make my way to the treasure, send the calling card, and face off against Dark Helmet. Okumura gets mopped. I simply abuse the weaknesses from earlier, and the waves of workers he sends get beaten one turn apiece. There was only one area where I couldn't kill the chief directors in time, but it was hardly an inconvenience, and I prevailed on the second attempt. After that was Akumura's executive director. It took a while to take him out, but when Joker has almost as much health as the rest of the party combined, there's very few things that could scare me at this point. Except the maze. God please don't take me back. The final thing standing between Okumura and an ice cold punch from J Frost was his robo daughter. With Okumura beaten, the thieves leave the palace. But on the way out, Haru must have stepped on a crack because she broke her father's back. Back in the real world, I max out Mishima's confidant, Maruki comes to where I live hoping to get the Kawakami treatment, Kawakami comes over and gets the Kawakami treatment, and I take Futaba to the theater because she's too young to get into R-rated movies by herself. The gang celebrates at Haru's castle estate, but when it comes time to see Okumura confess, he's off the goop. Literally. When I head back home, Akechi is waiting to ask me on a date, but when I deny his advances, he threatens to tell the world that we're the Phantom Thieves. With no choice left, I take him on a date in the metaverse, to a brand new casino that just opened up. 
turns out that the casino is size, Makoto's sister, and that all the games here are more rigged than an oil drilling site. Pissed that our first date is ruined, Akechi demands we steal her heart, and the sixth palace begins. In order for me to get to Sai's treasure, I need to play four games at the casino. Dice, slots, the house of darkness, and the arena. First up is the dice game. I know it's rigged from the start, so I don't waste time playing, and head straight to the back room to fight the demon controlling the outcomes. Nebi is a pretty tough persona, but he's weak to win. With Morgana in my party and Pyro Jack having a wind attack from a skill card I gave him, the fight ended in two turns. After beating Nebs, the gang decides to load the dice in our favor, because if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Moving on to the slots, I skip all the small bets and head straight for the High Rollers Club, because I need more chips and I have my father's gambling addiction. The slots are rigged too, meaning I'll have to pull a Tanya Harding to get through. I find the terminals after 40 years of looking, hit the jackpot, and move on to the rich people only floor. The first game on this floor is the House of Darkness. Surprisingly, there's no way to cheat here, it's simply reached the end of the maze. There's a lot of enemies here, but I avoid most of them, and the ones I do run into are weak to electric, so I have Ryuji spam his magic attacks. The arena is the last challenge required to reach Sai, and there's actually a good bit to talk about. The first fight is against two Ganesh. Typically they're annoying to deal with since they repel physical attacks, but since I only deal magic damage with my jack bros, it's not an issue. Next up is three Rongda, and it's more of the same. My goal is to freeze them to try for technical damage, but I was dealing damage significantly higher than I was expecting so they also got smoked. Last up was Thor. I had a big head by this point, so I didn't even try to block his charge and Megaton raid combo. He surprisingly took a good chunk out of my health, and if I were at regular health, it might have been trouble. But at max health, no hit is more than a tickle, and even though Thor took a while to beat, there was no chance at losing. Winning the arena gives me all the money I need to reach size treasure, but just like my ex-girlfriend, it's never enough. Thankfully, Akechi saves the day with Deus Ex Machina, and Sai is the only person left in our way. I try sending the calling card, but Akechi says that it won't work, and everyone believes him over me, because he's been a Phantom Thief for a day, while I've been the leader the entire fucking time. So, in the meantime, I max out Futaba's social link, and start Shinya's social link, only to do the request in Mementos, which gives me the skill card Null Physical. I also accidentally max out Maruki's Confidant, which is really gonna annoy you guys when I don't touch the third semester. Akechi finally lets us send the calling card, and it's go time. Sai's boss fight is just sad and royal. She went from one of the strongest bosses to arguably the weakest. After exposing her for cheating, she'll spin the wheel to decide what type of attack she'll do. Most of the time, she'll only attack one person instead of the entire party. Granted, she becomes resistant to almost all attacks during this state, but this new mechanic makes her stupid weak, since she can't do big damage unless she targets weaknesses. Meanwhile, the entire party wails on her non-stop, and by the time she reaches the almighty phase of her attacks, she loses her resistance and takes more damage. Simply put, Sai goes down like Jay Sean, and shit hits the fan. The police break into the palace, Joker tries to escape, but he gets arrested. And after a brief interrogation with Sai, Akechi decides that if he can't have me, no one can. Thankfully Akechi shoots as well as Lonzo Ball at the free throw line, so I end up surviving. But instead of going after Akechi, the gang decides to go after Lex Luthor instead. Shido's palace is broken into two segments getting five letters of recommendation from social elites, and a maze where you run around as a rat. The gang travels to the palace restaurant to get the first letter of recommendation from the politician. But rather than just handing it over, he turns into a snake instead and wants to fight. A fitting piece of symbolism. But by now, the run is basically over. With Joker's stamina and SP maxed out, there's nothing from here onward that can give me any kind of challenge. So after treading on the snake, the rat maze begins. Simply put, I hate these. 
It isn't fun, there's hardly any combat, and it isn't challenging. It's just me running around looking for small vents to go through and backtracking more than a cheating boyfriend who got caught in a lie. The second letter of recommendation comes from The Noble. And after nearly engaging in some Epstein activities, the gang decides to just beat the letter out of him instead. Wait, never mind, that almost sounds worse. Third is the TV station president. And after making some yo daddy jokes to Haru, he basically sealed his own fate. Before heading to the IT man for the fourth letter, I finally get to grab a new persona. King Frost is in this palace and picking him up is a massive boost. He's much stronger, has physical attacking moves, and he's needed to summon the Unholy One. The fourth letter comes from the IT man, and this is the only fight with the potential to give me trouble. The IT man knows a bunch of one hit kill moves, and it's the only way Joker will die at this point. Fortunately for me, he spends his turn summoning new enemies to help him fight. Unfortunately for me, the only challenge left in this game gets smoked with ease. The final letter of introduction comes from the cleaner, who's actually Yakuza. This fight was surprisingly hard for the party. The cleaner has no weakness, has a lot of health, and hits much harder than anyone else in the run so far. But Joker's just too swole from that time in the gym, and the fight ends anticlimactically. The gang heads to Shido's treasure, but Akechi pulls up, asking one last time for my hand in marriage. I refuse, and like most men, Akechi goes batshit crazy and attempts to kill us all. The first phase of Akechi's fight isn't anything special. He summons some evil versions of weak personas, and even though they have some decent strength to them, they have no defense and get wiped pretty quickly. The second phase ends before it even gets started. Joker, Ryuji, and Haru all have insanely strong physical attacks, so Akechi gets wiped before Robin Hood can even make a dent. Realizing he can never truly have Joker, Akechi awakens his third and final form, Black Ketchy. Black Ketchy is supposed to be scary, but it's just sad at this point. I use magic attacks when he reflects physical, and physical attacks when he reflects magic, and this fight was pretty brief. Akechi gets defeated by Star Wars Episode 2, and the Phantom Thieves escape, with the final fight with Shido just around the corner. Before sending the calling card to Shido though, I must summon the Unholy One. By sacrificing Pyro Jack, Jack Frost, and King Frost, I can summon Black Frost in attack mode. And I didn't stop there. I gave him charge for physical attacks, ice boost for 75% extra ice damage, and null physical to block all physical attacks. I had ascended. No longer was I the leader of the Phantom Thieves. I was now Death Incarnate. Eager to show off my power, I send the calling card to Shido, and my reign of terror began. Shido was nothing more than an ant who needed squashed by the Dark Lord. He didn't even have a chance to attack in his first phase. And even in the one-on-one -on -one showdown, Black Frost was nigh omnipotent. Shido was simply no match. To say this fight was a joke would be an insult to joke. This fight was like an Amy Schumer joke. Ashamed by his loss, Shido kills himself. And not to be outdone by Mr. Clean, Ryuji kills himself even harder. The gang finds out that the only way to bring Ryuji back is to destroy Mementos, so they head down into the depths for the final time. At the very bottom of Mementos, the thieves discover that the Cum Chalice is what powers humanity's conscience, and that not even the Dark Lord Black Frost can defeat it. The Holy Grail banishes the gang back to the real world and tries to remove them from existence entirely. But they survive, and after a motivational halftime speech, the thieves come out bawling in the fourth quarter. Holy Grail Volume 2 is nothing like the first fight. After realizing that the veins are keeping the Grail invincible, we cut them bad boys off, and the fight gets ugly after that. Ryuji and On have charge and concentrate now, and Joker has both, so the damage output is just unreal at this point. And with Makoto buffing defense and full healing every other turn, the fight doesn't take long. We think it's all over, but the Holy Grail said, I got some for they ass, and shows its true form, Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth is the final boss, so naturally he's going to be hard to deal with, right? 
Nope. Despite having a bunch of health, this fight was no issue. I have Joker focus on Yaldi exclusively, while An and Ryuji focus on the gun, sword, bell, and book whenever they come out. Makoto focuses on defense buffs and healing, and the final fight turned into a time trial to see how fast I could get it done. Yaldabaoth refuses to go down though, so I have to bring in the ultimate Jack bro. Jack's at denial. Jack's at denial keeps that thang on him, and Yaldabaoth gets caught lacking, proving two things. I can most definitely beat Persona 5 Royal with just the Jack bros, and Kendrick Lamar was right. The one in front of the gun truly does live forever. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, this one was a little harder to write because the fights got really boring really fast. I also had to cut a lot of footage for how plain it was, so I'm sorry if you didn't see a moment you wanted. Also, a massive thank you to my Patreon supporters. If you guys want to see more videos like this one, supporting me on Patreon helps a ton, and you can even join a private Discord with me. I'm glad to be working on Persona 5 full link challenge runs again, and I'm already working on the next one. So I'll be seeing you guys again soon.